has two connotations to it. One of these is that Christ lives in you. That is the heaviest weight of scripture we have. Christ lives in us, in Christ's position. But it also has a second connotation, which we've been discussing here and is always a question, uh, uh, particularly when we use the term Christ liveth in me, is that I am a living Christ person. I do not have a life outside of Christ. Now the reason why so many people get confused when we say Christ lives in me, therefore the life I live, the only life I live is Christ, they get confused when we say that we're living as Christ or Christ living as us because they don't understand that the only life we have is Christ. What is a new birth? What is the birthing? The birthing is that the only life you have is Christ. You've been rebirthed. So that means the old birth no longer stands. First Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says old things are passed away. What are the old things? Everything that had to do with the first birthing. That's the old thing. What is a new thing? Behold, all things become new. What is that? That's the new incorruptible seed in you. Corruptible seed is out. First birthing. Uh, new, new, new birth. The uh, new creation life is Christ in you. So it's, it's only one life you have. Now this is really what throws people. I had a conversation this week with somebody who was really upset over this because they had uh, gotten with some psychologists or psychologically inclined people who just couldn't take the fact that we had no human nature. We don't have a human nature. We've got a human mind, which we have called a nature. But that mind has come from the old sin nature that operated in us. When Satan operated through us, he could only operate through our mind. When God put him out at Calvary, we still had the same mind. No miracle for the mind. So we call that a nature, a human nature. Well, that's just a human way of doing No, that's a mind way of doing things. You see that? You got to get that fixed in your mind. You only have one birthing at a time. You don't have two birthings going on at one time. That, that would be incredible. Uh, that's why Paul come along and, and did away with nationalities. He said, in Christ, no Jew, no Gentile, no Greek, no, no Roman, no bond, no free, no Scythian, no barbarian. He did away with everything that has to do with first birthing. That's corruptible seed. He did away with it because he wanted us to know the only life we have is Christ. The Christ life. Well, that's what the Bible says, and says it more than it says anything else. But we're, we're all polluted with uh, religion and uh, religious ideas to where that can't break through us clearly. So when I use the term living Christ, I mean you're a living Christ. You're not Jesus of Nazareth, but you're a living Christ. You are an expression of Christ everywhere you go because the only life you have is Christ. Now, the reason we don't express him better is because we don't know that. We don't know that the only life we have is Christ, so we have a real problem expressing. Get that fixed in your mind right off with this series we're on. The only life you have is Christ. You don't have German life, Irish life, Italian life, Mexican life, Greek life anymore. You have only one life. The life I now live is Christ. Now, that's what you've got to get fixed or you can't go on. Either, either you were born again and Christ in you, your hope of glory, or you were not. If you were born again, then that preempts, overwhelms, does away with everything else according to the Scriptures. Now, if we don't want to go according to the Scriptures, uh, then we've got a problem. But our theme has been the living Christ. And I'm basing this for the time being on Galatians 2 and 20. I've told you that ought to be the golden text of the Bible, and we're going to make it the golden text for the Christ life. So if, if, if you will, go with me to Galatians 2 and 20, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. In our last session, we talked about a portion of this verse which we've not really dwelt on a lot in the past, and, and particularly in Institute. The, the first half of that verse we have lived with now for years. It says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, Christ liveth in me, and the life that Christ liveth in me. We stop right there. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now that's what all of our teaching has been on thus far. We're ready now to talk about the next line or two in this verse, which is where the Living Christ series is going to originate. 
The next line is what we talked about in last session that says, and the life which I now live in the flesh. Now, we talked about that. And if you don't remember that, you need to get the tape and go through that again and again. The life which I now live in the flesh, the life I now live in this body, in the life now in me. We talked about that. It's this next line we're concerned with today. This next line says, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Well, let's see if we can uh, uh, put that down as clearly as possible. The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Let's go to our tripartite being. Our tripartite being made out of body, soul, and uh, let's make Christ spirit, body, soul, and spirit. He says, the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now, how does that work? Exactly how does it work that the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God? In 1 Corinthians 1 and 30, we have a little verse that says, Christ has been made unto us wisdom. Made. It didn't say God gave us wisdom. It didn't say there was a gift of wisdom that God gave us. It said that Christ had been made unto us wisdom. So let's just put wisdom here. Christ is made wisdom in us. He's our life. He not only made wisdom, but he's made uh, sanctification. He's made righteousness. Uh, he's made knowledge. He's made a number of different things. In fact, he is our life. This is our life source right here. This is where we have life. But the Christ in us has been made wisdom. Well, where is the receiver? What is the receiving instrument in this creature? The receiver. What's the receiver? That's where the sound comes out. You, you've got the mechanism, the life, but you've got to have something that receives it, the speaker. Where's the speaker system? Here it is, the soul. The soul is the receiver. You've got to have a receiver. Now you have Christ in you, but this Christ cannot get out of spirit and out of your life except there be a receiver. Well, what's happened to most of us is we've got a line blocking him right here, and that line creates a self unto self. Instead of Christ having the liberty to move and operate through ourself, he stopped right here because we don't give him a receiver. What is a receiver in the human being? It's the soul. So what you have here, soul, that's mine, you have Christ's wisdom constantly available to you. But that wisdom's not getting into our minds. What is this wisdom? I am your only life. Christ liveth in me. Life I now live is Christ. What is this wisdom? It's a wisdom that is constantly coming up. But we're not receiving it. We're not receiving it. Why are we not receiving it? Because the soul over here is given probably to religion. What does religion say? Oh, religion says you don't have wisdom unless you listen to us. You don't really have knowledge unless you follow what we say. Now, I'm, not, I'm using religion in, a, in a, a sense that it says that you must do what we do to be what God wants you to be. We believe that's a lie. We believe that religion is erroneous at that point. That the facts are, religion is trying to get us to believe what it says in order for us to be what we ought to be. And that isn't so. I cannot, by believing what anybody says, be what I ought to be. I am what I am by the grace of God, which means a birthing. It means a birthing. Now, you understand that? I am what I am by a birthing and nothing else. Now, what happened to us here? 
instead of our mind receiving this wisdom, we turn to other areas. Our mind gets polluted, first by religion. Then we've got television, we've got things we read, we've got job problems, we've got all of these out-of-world problems over here that we attempt to fit into our minds. When we do, we block this wisdom from flowing. Because this wisdom needs no other source other than itself. Christ, Paul said, Christ is sufficient. Uh, Christ is my all and in all. Uh, Christ is my completeness. We have innumerable scriptures that tell us that this individual doesn't need any more than the wisdom of Christ working through him. And so what we do finally when we get hungry to know God is that in our minds we're going to have to turn our attention away from the outer source to the fact that if I have been born again, I have Christ in me. Once you do that, once you turn your mind from the outer sources to the inner Christ, then and only then do you begin to grow up in him. Out here you're growing up as a Methodist, a Baptist, a Catholic, and so forth. It is here that you begin to grow up in Him. Now that's why it's been so hard for us to get fixed that the only expression we have is this Christ. If we block His wisdom, if we keep His wisdom from flowing into our mind, then it's impossible for us to properly express Him. So the verse of Scripture, the one line in this verse says that the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Well, believe it or not, religion has divided us from the scriptures here. Do you know what the average teacher or preacher would say about that line? They would say, you look at your Bible now as I quote this, they would say that verse reads that I live now by my faith in the Son of God. Well, they do. They changed the preposition. Why would anybody want to change the preposition there? Because the faith of the Son of God and faith in the Son of God are entirely different. There is no correspondence between the two at all. Why would anybody want to change that? It's simple. They don't believe in the birthing. Or they talk about it, but they don't understand the birthing. They don't believe Christ is in them. Now, if we're going to literally believe Christ is in us, then we're going to have to take these verses of Scripture like they're written. For your information, and this is in, uh, uh, in our book, uh, Messages to the New Creation Race People. That's a book I can tell some of you need to concentrate on. You need to spend time in that book. Somebody said to me, well, it's a little heavy. That's where you need to be. You need to be in some heavy stuff if you're going to ask these heavy questions. And so that book will really help you. But in that book, we have five occasions written about where the word crystal pistos is used. That's Christ as knowledge, our faith, my faith. That's where five other verses say that the believer lives by the faith of the Son of God. Now, religion has attempted to change every one of those to where we come and lose, well, my faith is in Christ. I don't have the faith of Christ. If you're born again, you have the faith of Christ. If you're a sinner, you put your faith in Christ. They're two different things altogether, you see. So the scripture says, the life I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by this faith, the faith of the Son of God. Well, now that's different. You've been worried about your faith. You've been worried about how much faith you have. You've been worried about where you're going to get more faith. The facts are, the life you live in Christ, you live by his faith. He has never put the burden on you to live. He's put the burden on himself to live. He's put the burden on you to love him. What does that love do? That love means that you finally express him. Sooner or later, you as a self fall so in love with this Christ in you that his expression begins to come out. 
How do you understand how love works? When a boy falls in love with a girl, really falls in love with her, he thinks like she thinks. He, he does not think contrary to what he knows about her. If he knows she doesn't like a certain thing, he doesn't keep on doing it, even if it's his way of doing it. He loves her so much that he won't be contrary to her. What is love? That's what love is. Love is a decision you make. Love is a decision you make saying that I love this Christ in me so much that I have no other life but him. Now that's why we take all this time to go through it because your next thought is, well, I can't just be religious and spiritual all the time. No, that means that the Christ in you is what it is you're doing. He's the carpenter. He's the secretary. He's the truck driver. He's the, the mama. He's the daddy. He, he's the homemaker. The only life I now have is Christ. So you made a calculated decision to love. Once you see Christ is in you, you make the decision to love, and then the expression becomes him. See? The expression becomes him. We're talking about love now, and it's a good thing we're on this subject. You know how an old boy is. He won't do anything contrary to the girl before he marries her. <laughs> see? He's really in love with her. But after a period of time goes by, that love diminishes and he falls back into his old patterns. John talked about that. Book of Revelation. One of the churches. What had they done? They had lost their first love. What is that first love? That first love is where the whole attention is turned to the Christ that is in you. But because they're settled in their thinking and stop loving. They turn their mind to other things outside to be something within themselves, actually. They lost that first love. So the whole of our coming together and growing together in the Lord is to not lose this first love. When you have that first love, your expression is always Him. It'll always be Him. Because you won't want to do anything contrary to him. Well, that sort of gets us into the heart of our lesson with that brief uh, explanation. Now I want to, I want to hurry up and get into the, the rest of it. That ex gives some explanation to that line, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, the knowledge, the wisdom. That's what the word faith. I live by the faith of the Son of God operating through me. Let's take it literally. Well, now, in the living Christ idea, we have uh, we have the necessity of a framework. How do I, as this self, here I am, I'm a human self made of body and soul. How do I make this Christ in me work through myself? I ask the Holy Spirit to give you insight now as we go into this. How do I make it work? You make it work because self is the framework. It's the frame. It's the frame for the expression of the Christ that's in you. You yourself is a created image of God to express the Christ that is in you. You're, you're, let's, let's call it a framework. Without a framework, this can't be done. You, you can't express Christ unless you have some sort of framework to understand what self is. There, there, in fact, are three aspects of your life, your self-life. There are three aspects, the three important aspects of your self-life. That, that's a framework for Christ operating through you. First 
is thinking. Second is doing. Third is being. These are the three aspects of yourself by which Christ operates through. This is what he comes through. First, you're thinking. You're thinking. Proverbs uh, 23 and 7 has the famous little line in it that says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks, so is he. But now, that verse would lead us to believe it's Old Testament, it's a, it's a law scripture, and so its whole connotation is a little different than we would see it in the New Testament where it printed there. But let's take it and uh, put Christ in it and through it, through this verse. The verse says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Well, that's error for a new creation believer, one who is a new creation in Christ. That's an erroneous statement. That's not so. It is not my thinking that makes me who I am. Now, are you following me? Your thinking does not make you who you are. So when somebody uses that scripture, that ought to be the first thing that triggers in your mind, hey, that scripture is not right because my thinking does not make me who I am. It is my faith in Jesus Christ who made me who I am. My thinking doesn't make it. Now, why am I making a point of that? I've been rebirthed. Whether I think right or don't think right, whether I think good or think bad, is soulish and has nothing to do with who I am. I've been rebirthed. I'm born again. So my thinking doesn't make me who I am. But what does my thinking do? My thinking determines my expression of who I am. Now, see, that's a fine line to some people, but there's a world of difference there. There's a great difference between who you are and who you think you are. You see, if somebody come to me and wanted to uh, uh, question me on the statement, uh, you said Christ in you as you, uh, you mean you're Jesus Christ, I would tell them, who are you? I mean, I'd turn it around, and I'd say, well, I'd like to know who you think you are, and maybe I can answer you. Do you believe you're a Christian? Yeah, what makes you a Christian? Well, I'm a Christian because Jesus saved me. Well, how did he save you? Well, I was born again. Well, what does born again mean? Well, it means that God put his son in me. Then what does that make you? That makes you one in whom Christ lives. So you ask me how it is this Christ gets out of me. He gets out of me as I am. How does that Christ who has been birthed in you get out of you? Well, he comes out of me however I am, by whatever I know, how much I love, by how much faith I have. Sure. Well, the statement's sound then. He gets out of you like you are. You don't make him what he is, but he gets out of you like you are. So, your thinking does not create who you are, but your thinking determines your expression of it. As a man thinketh, so is he. If you think Christ doesn't live in me, then you're going to be doing your dead level best to act like a Christian. You're going to be an actor, an imitator. You're not going to be real. And of course, an actor falls into any role. You understand that about actors. Many Christians are actors. They can fall into whatever role it is. On the job, they're in one role. At home, they're in another role. At church, they're in another role. And probably when they talk to God, they're in another role. So they're actors. They're always role-playing. Uh, we don't have to do that because we can plainly and definitely say Christ in us comes out of us as we are. So my thinking does not determine who I am, but it determines who I think I am. As a man thinketh, so is he. But you were birthed to be something else. You can think any way you please. God gives you the liberty to do that. But once you fall in love with the Christ in you, your thinking is going to change. It's going to radically change. When I got a hold of the idea that Christ is my only life, my thinking changed. I didn't think like I did about my I didn't think about myself like I did before. 
I thought before, well, I'm kind of weak. Uh, God has to help me alone. Nobody knows my failures, my shortcomings. My thinking changed because I thought differently now. I thought Christ liveth in me. I'm in love with him. Whatever I do as Christ, I'm careful about what I do now, my doing. Well, that brings us to the, to the, to the second word here. This, this word, uh, Proverbs, what is it, 23 and 7? And the word doing is, is another aspect of your life. You're not only a thinker, but you're a doer. Now, you understand some of us think we're one thing and do another. And we don't know the difference. Some of us don't know the difference between what we think we are and what we do. Uh, sad to say, a lot of other people know that. They know the difference. They say, well, you said one thing, did another. You didn't know the difference because your thinking and doing are almost uh, uh, synonymous. But you, another aspect of your life, separate from your thinking, is your doing. Now, did you ever do something without thinking? I've had a lot of people tell me that. Boy, you did that without thinking, didn't you? And I've confessed to people when I was wrong. You know, I said that and did that without thinking. I'm sorry. So we know that doing and thinking are really two different things. Uh, for instance, uh, my thinking now says Christ liveth in me, but my doing is not always right down the line with that. So my doing is another aspect of my living, of my, of my self-life. And a good verse of Scripture for that is James 4 and 17. Uh, a little verse that says, uh, If a man knoweth to do right, and doeth it not to him, it is sin. If a man knoweth to do right and doeth it not to him, it is sin. So another aspect of yourself is doing. Now, the Christ in you is no sinner. So when we talk about doing, we're not talking about Christ doing through us. We're talking about this self doing. A self separated in spirit from the Christ and God's nature within you may do what is wrong. And so James says, if a man <coughs> knoweth to do right and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Our doing. You're a doer. Now, you have to understand this about doing. You're a proverbial doer. You remember past teaching. Satan was a doer in us. He did sin through us and told us it was us instead of him. Never was you. It was always Satan working through you, doing his thing. Uh, Jesus said to the, Jew, to the Jews in John 8, uh, it was his lust you were carrying out. It wasn't yours. It was his uh, because uh, you were given to him. You didn't know any different. It was his lust you were carrying out. And John finally said in the fifth chapter of 1 John, he, Satan, was a sinner from the beginning. So it was Satan sinning, sinning through you <laughs> it was his doing by using your mind. But he was lying to you. He was doing it, and on the other hand, lying to you, saying, you're bad. See, you're bad. You're no good. You're evil. Well, he's a liar. Wasn't you at all. It was him that was the doer in you. That's why Jesus can come in and be your nature and immediately begin to operate through you because he knows you were misused by Satan. Well, even though Satan was put out, your thinking didn't change. That's what takes time. That's the time element that's most important. Your thinking didn't change. So what is it we have to do? First, we take hold of our thinking. What you do sitting in this room as you come into this truth is to say my thinking's been wrong. I've been thinking about a Christ outside of me when he's been in me all the time. My thinking was wrong. So I've got to change my thinking. I've got to change my thinking from thinking out here that Jesus will come to me if I do what is right to the fact that he's already in me, can't come to me. I have Christ in me, and I need to think of him as being in me. Then once my thinking changes, then my doing will change. The thinking will turn to doing. 
Once you begin to think Christ lives in me, your doing is going to change. Now, that's, that's where I have faith in this gospel and faith in the Son of God. That's the faith of the Son of God. Your doing is going to change. The things you once did, you won't do anymore. You're, you're going to have a change there. Who was it uh, last week? Where was I? California. Somebody, <clears throat> somebody came to me and said, I just want to tell you uh, what a radical change has taken place in my life. I said, how's that? Said, said, I have uh, stopped doing some, some evil things I was doing. I said, how come you stop it? Said, I finally got a hold of this idea of Christ is in me. And I got tired of being separated from Christ every time I did them. He was still in me, of course, but I was separated in my mind. He said, I've stopped doing those things and said, i got blessed fellowship with Christ I've never had before. Well, that cheered me up because that means that your thinking will change your doing. But that's still not love. That's still not the pure love we're after. So what we're, we're finally after is uh, being. And a good scripture of that, 1 Peter 1, 23. Uh, I love that verse. Peter says here, being born again. He didn't say get born again. Jesus said that. G uh, Peter comes along and says, being born again. Being that. Being that. That's what you are. That's your being. You say, I'm a human being. What kind of a being are you? You're a Christ being. You're a being. You're not a going to be. You're a being. You're not a hope to be. You're a being. You see, our mind gets defeated because religion's always told us out here, hey, you've got to come here. You've got to do this. You've got to be that. You've got to do uh, the thing we do to be one of us, which made you feel like I'm not a good Christian and, uh, until I do what the rest of them are doing. And, and so you never were a being. You were always a doer. You never was an I ammer. You're always I'm a goner. See? How many old boys I've heard say, Well, I'm gonna quit my drinking one of these days. I'm gonna quit my carousing and take care of my little family. They're goners. They're never gonna do it. Because it isn't in them to do it. If they're born again, they got to see themselves as beers. I'm a being. Right now, I'm this. Every one of you sitting in this room that's born again are everything you'll ever be to God right now. Because he didn't depend on your expression. He depended on Christ, and Christ is in you, and he still depends on you. In you. He didn't depend on you doing right to get saved. He paid the price at Calvary. All you had to do was believe. And he's not depending on you now to make it work. He's dependent on Christ in you. And remember, the seed always brings forth fruit. You can quit and run away from this idea, but that seed's going to bring forth fruit in time because the seed's alive. It's Christ in you. Well, your thinking changes, and you become a doer. After you've been a doer for a little while, then you become a beer. You're a being. Being. Being what you are. You're not going to be good at it at first, you're a long way from being perfect at it. never will be utterly perfect in your expression. But you're going to be a beer before it's all over. Be. You're going to move into living this Christ. You're going to live him. In time, you're going to live him. And you're going to find out that most of the things you're doing has been him doing all the time. That's right. Him cleaning up the house. He didn't cuss when you hit your finger with a hammer. But it was him hammering. See? You're just now becoming a beer. Mm -hmm. You're being. You're being that. See? And that's where your mind is changing. That's where you're taking your mind from the world and fixing it on him. That's where you're turning your attention to who you are. You now are in being. Well, <clears throat> these are the aspects of yourself, what you are as a self. But now how do these things work out of you? Let's, let's uh, go theoretically into how this, this Christ in you works out of you and uh, using this same uh, format here. 
uh, I need a bigger board so you'll have to bear with me. For instance, uh, your thinking is what we call uh, I had to stop right there. Psychological. How does your thinking work out of you? How, how do we get this Christ in us, out of us? First, dealing with, with our thinking, dealing with our mind. Well, psychologically, it's thinking. It, it is the way we think. Uh, psychology, the study of human beings. How do human beings think? Well, we think erroneously. Let's talk about God for a moment. We all think God's up there somewhere. And our Father is. Won't, won't deny that. But we don't think Christ in us. So psychologically, we have a real burden that we carry between God being outside of us and God being in us, Christ in us. We carry a heavy burden psychologically between this fellow over here being in Christ, the same as I am, while I don't like what he does and don't agree with him. We carry a psychological burden. Uh, we have become stereotyped religiously uh, because we say, well, I don't know how anybody could go to that church and believe that, and yet they claim to be born again. We, we have a psychological burden on us because of the way we think. Well, I'll tell you what's happened to me. I've had, a, I've had a great change to come in my thinking because I used to be a stereotype religionist as hardcore as anybody and preach law as hard as any of them. But you know, if somebody comes and tells me now they're born again, I greet them as my brother or sister. You say, what if they didn't know what it meant? If they're born again, it didn't matter whether they knew it or not. You say, well, what if they lied and they weren't really born again? That's their problem, not mine. But by the confession of their lips, Paul says, we take their witness. So anybody that comes and tells me they're born again, I take their witness as that. If they lied, that's their problem. If they told the truth, then they're birthed by my father. And that automatically changes my relationship with them from being a worldling to being a family member. Have you ever had that happen to you? Have you in your, in your family, immediate family, ever met a, a loved one that maybe you'd heard about but never had seen before? Uh, maybe a great aunt or... A, even a cousin way down the line, you met them for the first time. You know what you did? You immediately, in your thinking, incorporated them in the family. I've done this before and I hugged them. I never had seen them before. Well, I do that to Christians. Christian walks into our meetings and I have it happen everywhere. I hug them. I hug them. We've got, uh, we've got a number of fellows uh, and gals uh, coming from a rehabilitation center to our meeting in uh, San Francisco. And uh, they're all born again, you know, but they're, they're in rehabilitation for drugs or alcohol. And uh, the minute they come to the door down there, I, I hug their neck. And I've seen some of them look like their eyes would fall right out. Because I knew they had been saved because in that rehabilitation program, they're all brought to a point of accepting Jesus if they stay there. So I try to incorporate them right into the family. I don't have any problem with that. It scares some of them. But I don't have any problem with that because psychologically I have moved in my thinking now to accepting people on the basis of their witness. Well, now we have to go a step further with that, and I've mentioned it before, and I think there's a good chapter on this in that book, uh, New Creation Raised People. Uh, you accept people now not on the basis of their giving or on the stereotyping program you're in. For instance, I couldn't accept everybody like that unless I felt like there's a good Baptist because I don't want them to demean the name of Baptist. So we finally accept people on the basis of their acceptance of what is, is the rule that binds us together. 
Well, you need to know in this group we have no rule that binds us together. If they are born again, they're our father's offspring and we'll accept them as such. Not because they qualify to be a good Christ life or a good Baptist, but because their witness is, I've been born again. That's the way we accept people. And I pray to God we never have a program to develop in the Christ life to where unless they are one of us like us, unless they give the same amount of money, unless they pray the same way, unless they sing the same way, unless they set the same way, I hope we never get to the place that we don't have somebody sitting on the floor. I hope we never get so stereotyped and so uppity that you have to dress a certain way to come to meeting. I like to have meetings once in a while where the ladies dress up. I like to see them dress up <laughs> once in a while just for the fun of it and for them to have fun dressing up because some of us don't get to go anywhere with these meetings, you know, and we like to see you dress up. But I hope it never becomes stereotyped that the way you dress and the way you are is what determines our fellowship because it doesn't. We're birthed to the same Father, and we're all different. Well, you say, shouldn't there be some decorum? If it's required, yes. I think there's a time we might record. I wouldn't want all of you to come uh, uh, slop it to my funeral. I won't see you, so it won't matter. But <laughs> I hope you respect me enough to come in gay clothes, not black. Come in gay clothes. But none of you will ever see my funeral because I intend to outlive all of you. <laughs> We're not stereotyped, and that's not the basis of our fellowship, you see. So our thinking changes psychologically. The world has us all fixed into stratas and into levels and into uh, different idealisms. We're not that in Christ. And we want everybody to feel acceptable here, and we never want to get so far along in this fellowship that people become stereotyped because they're not doing it like all the rest of us. I'm tired of that. I hope your love for God is what makes you give and come and be. You understand that? Because we're at liberty now to be free. We're, we want a little joy and happiness in serving God now. And I don't want that business to come on us psychologically again to where we're not what we ought to be because we don't do like everybody else does. Someone said to me not long ago in one of our meetings, said, well, I don't know whether you like me or not, I failed. I said, what do you mean? Well, I've been out singing. I grabbed him around the neck and hugged him. And I said, it'd have been as well if you didn't tell me, but since you told me, I love you all the more. And they felt so bad about their sin because they wanted to be rebuked in the flesh, you see. They didn't want to be loved. Because I put a weight on them they couldn't carry without giving up to Jesus. And that's the way we want to be. There are times a rebuke is necessary. The scriptures fill with them, and we'll, we'll give it when it's necessary. But most of the time, our thinking is in the process of being changed psychologically. Our thinking is being changed. Well, let's go to another term here. In the doing, the term is practical. The Christ life works out of us practically comes out of us practically. I think so many times about people who, who have to do something remarkable to be religious. Uh, we, I've watched people come into our fellowship across the country, and, and some of them uh, come in and they're just aghast at uh, uh, <laughs> seeing somebody sit on the floor and everybody drinking coffee while I talk, or a lot of places they're eating while I talk. And, and the message is going on, and it just floors them, you know. They just, the decorum is lost. Nothing, nothing sacred or religious there at all. And uh, I watch them. I watch them in their growth. They come to me and say, how can this go on? And I say, well, if I thought them stop doing that would make us more righteous, I'd do it. But I said, how can they be any more righteous than they are by the birthing? So I turn their mind not back to what we do, but to who we are. To our being. Well, it really bothers them when our doing doesn't fit a certain regimen or certain decorum. I want you to do what it is I want you always to do what it is 
that is compatible with the Christ in you. Because only Christ in you fulfills you. Well, we've got one group that meets. Uh, a, a, this fellow's an attorney. And he's really smart. He's a smart guy. And ever since he's been coming to that meeting, he sits on the floor. And he has two or three Bibles in front of him. And sometimes he lays on his stomach and he writes. And no decorum at all. And he has a cup of coffee sitting there. And he just... <laughs> He has gone wild over this message. It has revolutionized his life, and I'm, I'm so thankful for him. And uh, people uh, see him, and they think, well, uh, how can this be the gospel? How can this be church? How can you call this church? Here he's laying on a rug in a person's front room. Uh, how can this be? And the facts are, our doing finally correspond with who we are. Now, until this fellow, using him as an illustration, really became who he was in his worship to God, it didn't take hold of him. And he, he said to me on occasions, he said, I used to go to church and sit there and wonder why I was there. He said, I used to sing the songs and pray the prayers and go through the whole regimen, and he said, there was nothing. And I said, that's simple. That wasn't you, that wasn't you. Well, he said, how come I like it so much better laying on a rug here? I said, simple. That's getting close to you doing practically who and what you are. And you're getting down to who you are. Now, I said also, you may not always be this, this loose. There may be somebody who you're hurting in time to come who wonders why you're doing what you're doing and you'll correct some of the things you're doing so you won't hurt them anymore because your love for the Christ in you will grow like that. But I said, you're coming now to the knowing of who you are. And this is the real you because now the message is getting through. You're happy. You're at peace. Uh, you're having a liberty and a freedom you never knew before. You're coming into that. It's becoming practical. See, Christianity is innately Christian. It's practical. It's practical. Christ in you is practical because you were created to possess a deity and Satan misused you so he wasn't practical to your to yourself. He was contrary to yourself. He was always contrary to yourself. That's why he lied and John called him the father of liars. Now that Christ is in you, your real self is coming forth. That's the real you. So I'm not going to hamstring it. I'm not going to say for it to be the real you, we have to all believe like this and sing like this and pray like this and do this and do that. I can't do that right now. But as you grow in the Lord, you're going to do certain things that really do fulfill who you are. Now, getting back to my lawyer friend, the real him may be somebody who will dress in a, in a nice shirt and tie and come and sit in a meeting with a decorous spirit. But he has to go through finding who he is first. Yeah, I don't know who he is. And I like him just as much as he comes in with a tie and sits in the chair like, like this fellow here. <laughs> but my interest is in finding, you finding out who you are and making it practical. You see, the doing must become practical. Let's talk about witnessing for a moment because some of you who have been in uh, evangelical and fundamental churches have had to go through a witnessing thing sooner or later. You had to witness to be one of them. You ever, you ever have that feeling set in the church? I have, to, I have to go do this to be one of them. I remember as Baptists, we have visitation every Monday or Tuesday night from the Sunday uh, services, and I made people feel real bad that didn't come to visitation. <laughs> Most of them didn't, so they all felt bad, I guess. But I made them feel real bad. I asked God, you ought to get out to visitation. You ought to win souls. And then I, then I went through a period when I worked with colleges where we always had this this thing of street witnessing. We like to get the kids out witnessing on the street, passing out tracts, doing something to break them loose so that they'd be a witness for Jesus. Well, believe it or not, that was always kind of contrary to me. I pastored a church one time where I had a Thursday night meeting called Meet Human Need where I had as many as 200 people on a Wednesday night out knocking on doors. We knocked on over 250,000 doors. During those years, we had that program. We saw a lot of souls won. People say, but you know, I brought law down on those people unbelievably to keep that working. I had them doing 
in programs that were unbelievable. And I had a multitude that always felt guilt because they didn't make that program. I had a big church, so the rest of them were evidently full. I hope they left full of guilt the way I said it. Maybe they'll get out here next Thursday night and go knocking on doors. But it wasn't in them. It wasn't in them. And you know something? I did it, and it wasn't in me. Now, I'll just tell you how preachers are. I went knocking on doors, and I didn't like it, and I didn't want it. And I helped people. I found somebody in need and prayed for them. But it was contrary to me. And yet I had other people who ate that up. I mean, that was right down their alley. But I didn't have a program that I could allow people to be uh, practical doers. Now, you think, well, he doesn't force us to do anything in these meetings. Nope, not going to. But I'm going into this detail so you'll know how I feel about it. There is in me a thing that says every one of you ought to be out knocking on somebody's door and getting them out to the next meeting. We need to win souls. But that's not practical doing because that may not be in you. The question is, when you really fall in love with this Christ that's in you, you'll be amazed at who is attracted to you. So the problem's not in reaching them. It's in him reaching you and, and being able to operate through you. It'll become very practical. I want it to be practical for you. I want Christianity to be practical for you. If it isn't practical, it isn't really you. And I think the world knows that. As a lady said to me one time, she said, everybody in my office had me pegged as a blazing evangelist out trying to rid somebody of going to hell. And she said, that wasn't me at all, but I was under such guilt that I worked with all these people who were going to go to hell, and somebody ought to try to stop them. But she said, I didn't stop them. I turned them off from Christ. I turned them off. Then this message came along. I've told you this one before. This message came along. And she said, for over a year, I didn't talk to one of them. They wondered about me. But she said, I lived it. Practically, Christ worked out of me. I started doing the little things that a Christian would do. Loving here and there. Cheering them up. Saying the right word. Bringing them a flower. Doing the things that a Christian would do practically that fit me. And she said, I was so happy doing it. I didn't have that weight on me that they were rejecting me and nobody in the office loved me. And then she said, after about a year, all of a sudden, they all begin to beat a path to my desk. And she said, every one of their problems and trials I begin to wrestle with, they wanted me to help them then. But she said, I had to turn from something I wasn't to who I was practically. Now, if you're not practically a great witness, don't worry about it. Don't fret over it. But be who you are because God will express himself by the Christ in you according to the way he made you. You understand that? And that's what the world needs to see is a practical doer. One that does practically because of Christ who is in them. But then there's another word that we have that goes with being, and that's the word spiritually. The Christ in you works out of you spiritually. Now, I would, uh, I would be lying to you if I told you that the Christ in you did not overbear your personality, not do away with it, but overbear it. I would lie to you if I didn't say to you that the Holy Spirit will cause you to make changes in the way you do things. Because he will. This, this Christ in you, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. This Christ faith, this Christ wisdom in you will work out of you spiritually. And it'll make some changes. A believer doesn't lie and steal and curse and do the things that are contrary to Christ in him once he gets hold of the knowledge. Now, you're, get, you're getting that by listening to me as the Holy Spirit brings it to you. You're getting that as you read your Bible. But the Christ in you is going to work out of you spiritually. 
righteously. He'll work out of you righteously. He'll come forth from you righteously. You'll do what is right. He who sins will sin no more because the Christ isn't a sinner. And once the love affair turns to him, then he spiritually begins to come out of your being. As a beer, he'll come out of you spiritually. You won't get that immediately, but it'll begin to happen. It'll begin to take place. He will come forth from you. Why is this? Why does it happen like that? It happens like this because this love affair makes you to know that you have something very valuable. Three terms I want to add to this. There are three important terms. Value, responsibility, and commitment. three terms that fit this trilogy of thoughts. The thinking believer finally can... Guess I'm doing that myself. I hope not. His life working out of me. What about business? How do we get his life out of us? This valuable thing in us. How does it come out in a trying period? I remember something Watchman Nee wrote in one of his books. Well, it happened over in China. They live on hillsides. All the farms were built on a hillside. And the water came from the top down the hill. And the farmer on top was a very selfish man and felt like he owned the wells on top. And so uh, he went out one day and stopped up all the wells from going down and just watered his own crops. And the farmer living right beneath him, whose very livelihood depended on the wells, saw his crops begin to dry up. So he went and talked with the brethren in his church. And the brethren in the church said, well, this is a good issue. We've got to, you've got to live Christ. And he said, how am I to live Christ with this situation? They said, we don't have the answer, but you need to wait on the Holy Spirit. And the issue was death was working in him and his family because they would starve to death. And so the question was how to get the life out. This valuable thing in him, was it more important than the skirmish over water? That was the issue. As is all issues in your life, is Christ in you more important than the situation at hand? So he waited before God, and this is what he did. It took him all day long to water his own crops. But what he did, at night, he would go up and turn the water on and water all of the crops of his enemy. Did it himself. And then when he got all of the crops of his enemy watered, he opened the gates and spent the rest of the time watering his own crops. He did it for several days, and finally his enemy was laughing at him and said, Ha, oh, I got the guy working for me now for nothing. He's watering my crops. Didn't appear to be much life in that, did it? But finally the Holy Spirit moved and the man's conscience got heavy. One day he said to him, How in the world can you work day and night watering both farms? How can you do that? And the fellow said, It's Christ in me. Not me, it's him. Jesus, is that real to you? Yep. Christ, is that real to me? Never met a God like that. You ought to know my Jesus. I well, said, I'll say one thing for him. He waters my, fa my farm good. What was the end result? While he died, this other came to life. Sure, it cost him. Scripture said, once we're all led as sheep to the slaughter. We're all dying that others might live. That's how Christ gets out of you. We could take other issues. You know why 50% of Americans end a divorce? Because 
There's no commitment to the responsibility that comes when you have a valuable thing. That's these three terms. There's no commitment to responsibility to what's about. Marriage should be valuable. Anybody married ought to take responsibility or they ought not to be married. When you take responsibility, it must not be idly. It must be sincere. Thus, you must make a commitment to it. Commitment. People who won't make a commitment lose things of value. There's a little commitment in our world of money today only to the numbers. There's no commitment to marriage, only to selfishness. You do business with people, even Christian people, to make a dollar is more important sometimes. There's no commitment to doing what is right. It's hard to find somebody that's honest. It's hard to find somebody that even knows what they're doing in many areas of life today. Because there's no commitment. What is commitment? Commitment is an under death thing. See, it's under death. It's the pig saying to the chicken, you've never known what commitment is. Because all you do is bring an offering to get ham out of me. It's a commitment. <laughs> well, that's, that's the way God's work carries on. One of the one of the things that happens in our fellowship is that a lot of people are not committed. I admire those that are committed. We have people that's committed to this month of Sunday's meeting. I watch some of you. I know you have heavy schedules. You work hard. But I see you set aside a large day. You're not harassed what you do on the other three Sundays, where you go, what you do. But I think you could commit yourself to a Sunday, at least once a month. That's not a law. It's just... It's a matter of commitment. People are committed to it. Somebody said to me uh, yesterday, was an airline pilot sat by me on the plane. He said, you mean you, you go up to Portland every month uh, for going on six years? I said, that's right. Boy, he said, you're committed to them, aren't you? What makes you so committed to them? I said, they're blessed people. That's what he said. You're really committed to them to do that. Well, I'm committed. Many of you are committed. I wouldn't let anything hinder that commitment. What is commitment finally? It's a decision of love. You know why some people are committed to give money to God? I don't jump on this often, but it's important here. You know why, you know why some people don't tithe or give an offering to God? There's no commitment. And commitment is the practical act of love. I'm committed to it. That's where the love begins to take hold is by commitment. If you don't commit, you won't have it. I have people who say, well, I'm not under the law. I'm not going to catch me uh, tithing and giving regular offerings. There's no commitment. But I'll tell you this. People who don't commit to God don't commit to other things either. Their lives show it in many different areas. Because commitment is a heavy line of love. That's the heaviest <laughs> mark you make of love. I'm committed to. Marriages break up because people are not committed. They're not committed to the marriage. I tell everybody I marry, if you don't marry this person, if, if, if you don't love this person uh, unto death, if, you, if you're not committed to the marriage, you ought not to marry. See, it's a, it's a commitment unto death. I made my mind up one day that, that uh, I love uh, Robbie and that uh, she was mine till one of us died. It was a commitment. And I've been mad enough sometimes to run. She's been mad at me plenty of times. <laughs> I'm not easy to live with, I guess. But it was a commitment. We made a commitment in marriage. Love is a commitment. Loving somebody is not being in love with them. Say, well, I love God, I go to church. You may not be in love with him. In love is the commitment. Like a little girl I counseled not long ago, I looked at her, she's getting a divorce from this fellow, and I said, Have you, do you love him? Oh, yes, she said, I love him all the time. But she said, I'm not in love with him. That's why we treat God. 
Sure. They had sex, she loved him. He went and bought her something, she loved him. Took her out to eat, she loved him. She loved him, but she wasn't in love with him. That's a different matter. That's the way people treat God. My, my eyes got open when I heard her say that. I knew what was wrong with Christians then. They're not in love with God because being in love is a commitment. You really commit to Him. Your money, your time, your effort, it's a commitment. Your marriage is a commitment. To raise the children right is a commitment. A lady said to me not long ago, I don't think I could teach my children. I didn't tell her, but I'll get it across the message. When she really loves those children enough, she'll teach them. She's teaching them anyhow. Whether she does it practically or not, she's teaching them anyhow. Don't tell me you can't teach your children. Shut the television off, sit down with a storybook, read them a story, tell them what you think about it. Say, well, I don't know much about it. Tell them what you think about it. You say, well, that won't be like getting it from a Sunday school teacher. Be better, because they're getting lessons from you every day in other areas. They might as well get a Bible lesson from you. See, they're getting it anyhow. Give it to them. Teach them. Teach your children. Bring them under the Word of God. So what is of value to you works out of you by death. When circumstances and situations come that are unto death, that's when it's important what you do. For instance, somebody said to me like, go, well, I can't come to a meeting. I've just got too many problems. Well, I'm not going to rebuke them right then because they couldn't handle it. They needed, they needed some strength then, not, not me to knock the prop out of them. But I'll get it across the message that when they fall enough in love with the Lord, then they'll handle their circumstances and situations. You see, that's the way it is. Well, commitment is to the thing that's of value to you. <clears throat> what is the greatest value we have? Christ in this earthen vessel. A treasure. You have a treasure in you. Christ is in you. He's the treasure. Now it's got to come out of you. It's Paul saying, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, the righteousness, the wisdom, the love of the Son of God. So Christ is working out of you.